everyone and welcome to Gender and Society. I'm super happy that you all are here. Uh, my name is Dr. Frankie Mastrangelo. Um, you can call me Dr. M, Dr. Frankie, just Frankie, uh, whichever works. My pronouns are she or they. And yeah, our class is an asynchronous class. So, you know, some of you may know the drill. You've already taken asynchronous classes before, or it may be new to some of you. But know that, you know, we are doing the work on our own time each week. So, you know, every week I'll post a video like this. I will, you know, share any relevant links and you all will do the readings that are listed in the syllabus and I'll share some questions to prompt discussion and then we'll all chat on the Canvas discussion thread and that will take the form of our class discussion for the week. Uh, so we won't meet real time on Zoom, um, but know that if you ever want to talk to me, you know, in real time. You can always visit my student hours, um, which are on Tuesdays at 2 or Wednesdays at 10. Um, my Wednesday student hours are in person in Founders Hall, and my student hours on Tuesday are on Zoom. So yeah, um, feel free to, you know, pop in whenever, just say hi or, you know, ask any questions. And of course, that is totally optional. You all made the decision to take an asynchronous class. So if you can't visit my student hours, there's no requirement for that. Um, but yeah. So, um, you know, as we move into this week of discussion, I do think it is really important to emphasize that, you know, we're delving into, you know, different key terms and concepts that are going to be woven throughout the semester and really offer us, you know, a foundation to, uh, you know, engage with these topics and, you know, will offer us a shared language for discussing the topics that we're going to be discussing this semester. But, you know, know that, you know, everyone may be at different points in, you know, their engagements with and understandings of these particular, you know, key terms and concepts. Um, know that, you know, we're all engaged in a learning process and wherever you're at in your understanding is totally fine. So, you know, as we, you know, move into these discussions, I do think it's really important to, um, you know, recognize that we're here to support one another and, you know, support one another's learning and, you know, growth and understanding uh, these different ideas. So, um, you know, be patient with yourself, be kind to yourself if, you know, you're, uh, you know, figuring things out and um, know that we're all in this together. We're all figuring things out and learning about things. So, yeah, this week we are first thinking about what is the distinction between biological sex and gender. So let's get into it. So, um, you know, as we're thinking about biological sex, it is really important to think about how, you know, biological sex is composed of various intricate nuances of, you know, chromosomal makeup, as well as different sex traits like, you know, gonads, hormones, genitalia, and whatnot. So, you know, social understandings or popular social understandings of biological sex tend to be limited to a binary framework. So we're going to hear this word a lot during the semester. So we're going to be talking about what does it mean to limit our understandings of gender as well as other various ideas to a binary. So a binary, you know, refers to thinking about things as only two options, when in fact there are more options and, you know, there are, you know, vast ranges of possibilities beyond those, you know, two particular options. So as I'm sure you all can infer, when it comes to biological sex, we tend to think about this in terms of a binary that would be regarded as male or female. So when we're thinking about the vast range of, you know, chromosomal differences, you know, different, um, you know, variations when it comes to sex traits, it's important to recognize that there is 
much room for variation, much room for fluidity that goes beyond, you know, just very rigid notions of what we would classify as male and what we would classify as female. So when we think about, you know, those nuances and complexities of biological sex, it helps us understand that, um, you know, we can think about this, you know, the particular concept of biological sex beyond, um, you know, the male or female uh, binary possibilities. So, you know, when it comes to biological sex, we're also thinking about secondary sex traits that further reinforce how biological sex is subject to fluidity and variation. So secondary sex traits would refer to, you know, hair, breasts, um, you know, shoulder size, um, different things that are connected to hormonal variations that, you know, usually are, you know, intertwined with the onset of puberty, you know, when we um, experience various changes. So thinking about how those secondary sex traits are very subject to change, such as, you know, taking things like puberty blockers or, um, you know, hormonal replacement therapy and things like that. So, you know, when we recognize that there are so many possibilities for, you know, shifting those secondary sex traits, you know, we further see how um, biological sex is uh, subject to variation and you know, different forms of fluidity. So biological sex is different than gender. So, you know, we just define biological sex as, you know, these intricate nuances of chromosomal makeup and sex traits, whereas gender is, you know, how society and culture tends to place us in binary boxes. Um, so, you know, society and culture tends to place us in, you know, these rigid categorizations of what is male or female and assign different, you know, traits of masculinity or femininity to those boxes. So, you know, in thinking about how various social norms within our culture, so various, um, you know, social structures that we navigate on a daily basis, which we'll unpack as the semester goes on, um, we're thinking about how, you know, conceptualizing gender in such a binary way um, is very much, you know, socially defined. It's very much, you know, impacted by culture as well. Um, and we're th also thinking about, you know, you know, when we think about biological sex and how, you know, it is uh, defined in these, you know, rigid binary terms, um, there are so many different factors that, you know, reinforce how, um, you know, how those binary categorizations take shape. Like, you know, medical institutions, um, you know, different forms of healthcare, all of these different spaces reinforce the, the binary categorizations of both biological sex and gender. So more on gender, let's think about this a little bit more. So when we think about social norms that, you know, reinforce these binary categorizations of, you know, masculinity and femininity in accordance with, you know, being male or female, we're thinking about, you know, how toys are marketed to kids. We're thinking about, you know, how, um, you know, young kids when they're in educational settings like elementary school, how, you know, they're taught to express their emotions or not express their emotions, how different, you know, conceptions of like boys will be boys um, really fuels this notion that, um, you know, boys are aggressive in various ways. And that's just something that, um, you know, is innate to them, which, you know, we'll be unpacking, you know, further in the semester, but you're know, making those sweeping generalizations is something that, you know, is very intertwined with, you know, conceptualizing gender in such a rigidly binary way and is really something that is, you know, socially constructed, defined by the cultures that we're navigating. So it's important to, um, you know, as we move through the semester, you know, deconstruct those ideas, um, think about how they impact those around us, how they've impacted us and whatnot. And with that, think about, you know, how these different overlapping categories of, you know, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, ability, all of these different factors also impact the way that we experience, um, you know, the social construction of gender. So thinking about, uh, you know, how 
various, you know, structures that structures and standards that, um, you know, we experience based on, um, you know, the various cultures that we grow up in, um, you know, those various facets of identity and experience that I just mentioned, they create these paradigms. So in other words, sets of standards that, you know, provide us with frameworks for how, you know, we define gender and whatnot. So, you know, thinking about, um, you know, I grew up in an Italian American family, for instance, and thinking about the ways that, um, you know, like, you know, different like Italian American folks from New York and New Jersey might, you know, define gender in very particular ways, um, you know, like, uh, men are supposed to be waited on and, you know, women always clear the table, um, you know, and that's not just limited to Italian American households, but thinking about that's one incarnation of, um, you know, a particular culture that manifests different, um, you know, paradigms for, you know, how we experience gender and, you know, sets of standards for gender. So this is all not to say that we are limited to, you know, those uh, particular standards that we're limited to those structures, but thinking about these are all ideas that, you know, are, you know, reinforced by the environments that we grow up in. Um, they're all impacted by our intersecting identities. Um, you know, so all of these things come together to define, uh, you know, how folks experience gender. Um, so, you know, thinking about if we understand gender in these ways that are, you know, socially constructed, that, you know, are shaped by culture, um, this is distinct from gender identity. So, you know, gender identity would, you know, refer to how one experiences gender um, for themselves. So, you know, how one personally navigates the experience of gender, which is very much, you know, subject to fluidity. So thinking about, you know, folks that define their gender identity outside of binary categorization, there's a whole host of ways that, you know, one can identify. So, you know, some terms that they delve into in the reading, and I really do encourage folks to, you know, check out the reading to, you know, see how, you know, various ideas are further unpacked. We're offering, you know, a broad sketch in, you know, this particular discussion, but thinking about, you know, ideas like gender queer, um, non-binary identities, um, agender identities. These are all ways that, you know, folks can identify um, in resistance to the binary, outside of the binary, and whatnot. Um, we can also think about the ways that uh, binary gender categorization is very much intertwined with colonialism and imperialism, and we see that particularly through how the reading um, educates us on two-spirit identities. So thinking about two-spirit identities will be defined as, um, you know, gender identities in resistance to colonial logic. So thinking about the ways that indigenous communities are reclaiming gender identification outside of binary categorization. So thinking about the ways that, um, you know, different forms of colonialism and imperialism have, um, you know, shaped the ways that, uh, you know, different forms of binary identification, binary frameworks have become embedded in different cultures and imposed on, you know, various cultures. So, what else? Let's think about, you know, some other key terms that um, emerge through the reading that, you know, we're parsing out in this discussion as well as thinking about the distinction between gender identity and gender expression. So while gender identity is how, you know, we navigate our personal sense of gender, um, you know, we're thinking also about how gender expression would refer to, you know, the various choices, you know, hairstyles, different aesthetics that, you know, one may engage with to um, convey how one, you know, experiences their gender. So, um, you know, it's thinking about the appearance of gender and, you know, how folks express that. So thinking about, you know, 
a key way to consider, you know, the distinction between gender identity and expression and, you know, how these are distinct ideas is, you know, for instance, we could consider, you know, say a young kid is, you know, a teenager is living at home and they may identify as non-binary, but may not necessarily feel safe to express their gender in the way that they want to because of, you know, the family system that they're a part of, the various, you know, paradigms that their particular family is, you know, subscribing to and reinforcing. So, you know, because of one's environment in that case, one's gender identity may not necessarily align with the expression of their gender. So that's just one example. Um, so the two last concepts I want to, you know, discuss a little bit to offer us, you know, sort of a framework for, you know, um, beginning to talk about these concepts this semester is um, transgender and cisgender. So, you know, transgender would, you know, refer to any movement away from assigned or, you know, unchosen gender um, gender identification. So thinking about, you know, when folks identify as transgender, there is this movement away from an imposition that, you know, may have been, um, you know, offered to them at birth that doesn't necessarily align with, you know, how um, folks want to express their gender or how they do identify. And, you know, the expression of this can take the form of, um, you know, hormone replacement therapy. It can take the form of surgery, um, but it doesn't always. So it's important to recognize that, you know, there's a variety of ways that, you know, folks can identify as transgender, that folks can experience um, being transgender. So um, that's really key to keep in mind. And, you know, we often hear the term trans as, you know, an umbrella term that refers to um, a wide variety of gender variants. So, yeah, keeping that in mind as, as we move into the semester. And, um, you know, thinking about, you know, folks may have encountered this term already as well, but, you know, no worries if not. But, um, you know, cisgender would refer to, you know, folks whose gender identification aligns with, you know, the sex that they were assigned at birth. So the prefix cis actually means on the same side of. So thinking about, you know, when folks identify as cisgender, um, you know, it's it's essentially, you know, this um, way of experiencing gender that, you know, matches up with what they were assigned at birth. Um, being, you know, so cisgender identities is also linked to this concept of cissexism. So, you know, cissexism would refer to the ways that, you know, people may assume that everyone is cisgender. So this assumption that everyone's uh, gender identification um, lines up with, you know, what they were assigned at birth, whereas, you know, as we see in this discussion, there's so many opportunities for, you know, folks to identify that, you know, are outside of, you know, the rigid boxes that were essentially, you know, presented um, to us at birth. So, you know, when we think about, you know, sex and gender in more expansive ways, it, you know, resists this idea of cis sexism and, you know, combats this idea of transphobia. So in other words, you know, this idea of discrimination, um, you know, or um, hostility towards trans identities. But, you know, we see through this discussion that, um, you know, there are so many ways to identify and um, the options that were often presented at birth are very limiting. So, yeah, um, we will talk more about this on the discussion board, and I look forward to hearing what you all have to say and getting into our first week of discussion. So, yeah, talk to you all soon.